Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito The Black and Gold Banneret Podcast is brought to you by Orlando Homes Express, brokered by EXP Realty, proudly serving Orange, Seminole, and Lake Counties. Call 407-790-9957 or visit WeSellOrlando.net. Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and Brian Murphy with you here on, uh, well, this is our first like actual November show is here we are in November. The the weather's getting cooler. Well, it's not. It's like eighty five degrees out. Who am I trying to fool? Yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I know. What? Yeah, I know. What 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 am I even saying here? It's it's absolutely crazy. So much for you know late season fall football. What's up, Lopez and Murph? How you guys doing? Oh, uh, am I going to go first? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm great. How are you? you? <laughs> yeah, it's it. Everything's fine. Everything's. Fine. I'm a little under the weather, so I'm going to mostly defer to you guys today. Are you just show. sick? Is the, the 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 latest college football poll just make you literally uh, sick? That well, it set, it sent me over the edge. I also have a four year old, and and like you know, around November is when like eventually, you know, so he goes to school, he goes to preschool, right? And eventually, it's just going to get you at some point, and it's finally gotten yeah. me. So those meddling kids, uh, they always get you. Little little freaking germ factories. All right, we are. <laughs> Black and Gold Banner at the uh, home of your UCF Knights on SB Nation. Uh, you can follow us at blackandgoldbanneret.com, where we have one busy week for you. Um, in addition to, uh, it, it, well, I mean, we've got football. We've got men's soccer hosting the uh, conference championship. We've got volleyball with a big weekend. Uh, lots to talk about today. We've got, uh, also we have as a guest, Mitch Northam from our sister SB Nation blog, Against All Enemies. They cover uh, the service academies, and Mitch covers Navy. So he's going to chime in and uh, give us a little lowdown on uh, the midshipmen who've fallen on a little bit of hard times this year. So we'll be able to figure out. So so we're trying to figure out some of that with him. Uh, You can follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret. And you can follow us individually at Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric Lopez Elo and Spokes underscore Murphy, uh, respectively. All right, let's dive in, boys. Coming off the win against Temple, uh, UCF is now 8 and 0, 21 consecutive victories. It looked a little hairy at times. 52 40 was the final, um, but UCF came away um, with the victory despite giving up 670 yards of total offense. That's a school record. For Temple, mm-hmm. um, but UCF put up 630 of their own and held Temple um, in the second half. Uh, by the way, to uh, what was it? Six points in the second half, Murph, and yep. the Knights come away with a Thursday night victory and have the extra two days to um, prepare for Navy. But uh, you were there. What was the feeling coming off of that game? It's kind because of, I know I was watching the game. It's kind of like, ugh, man. All right, well, we got out of that one. Yeah, and you know, it's you're not going to get a big rise out of Josh Heupel any either way, right? You know, we well we don't know what he's like when he loses, but when he wins, even if it's a thrilling win or if, if it's an easy one, it seems like he gives the same speech. Uh, it's all it's all it's all one and zero, guys. It's all one and zero. It's it's ridiculous. I think I I I am going to get a one and zero jar set. I've been saying this for a couple of weeks. I need to go back and listen to all my tapes. Every time this team has mentioned one and zero on something I have recorded, I got to put a dime in a jar, and I will collect this. Uh, regardless, uh, yes, this defense was not good in the first half. Uh, it was it was downright awful. Uh, I didn't know why Temple would like why Temple ran any play in which they weren't throwing over to the middle of the field. 
Like, why would they run, why would they run any play in which they didn't throw a pass play over the middle of the field? Because UCF, with its linebackers and safeties, could not guard anything between the hash marks in the first 30 minutes. Uh, yeah. But as this def- as this defense is wont to do, for some reason, uh, it just turned it turned completely around in the second half, especially the third quarter, where it, which has been this team's uh, inexplicable strength. Uh, you know, the entire season they can talk about halftime adjustments and everything, but whatever it is, it's it's happening. Uh, you know, they they shut Temple out coming out of the half. They outscored them twenty four to six. In the, in the second half entirely. But in the third quarter this season combined, I believe now that they have outscored their opponents, I believe it's 91, 91 to 20. Man. In the third quarter of all games this season, this was the fifth time in eight games they've shut out an opponent in the third quarter. It's just weird how this whole thing operates because the offense couldn't possibly look any, tooth, any more toothless than it did in the first half, and then it's completely different in the second 30. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it was it's a credit to, you know, the coaching staff. First of all, I think, you know, that they were able to keep pace right before halftime. I thought that when they got that score right before the half, that was key. Um, I went back and looked at it over the last three games. Um, UCF has given up, the defense in the second half has given up a total of 13 points. They forced mm-hmm. seven turnovers in the second half. They've given up a fair amount of yards. I'll be real with you on that one, but... Their yards per play allowed is lower in the second half, 5.5 to 6.4. And this one, I think, is the most important part. In the first half of the last three games, and I wrote about this on blackandgoldbanneret.com, opponents are 13 for 22 on possessions. In other words, they scored, they've scored at least some points on 13 of their 22 possessions in the first half against the UCF defense. In the second half, Opponents' offenses are batting 100, 2 for 20. Um, the Knights are giving up 0.65 points per possession in the second half. Compare that to 3.05 in the first half, the last three games. So I think we need to give some credit to Randy Shannon for figuring out what what the opponents are doing, getting the game plan for the second half down, you know, down pat. And this defense has completely taken over. They've gotten the, they've gotten the, the timely turnovers as we saw against Temple. And Anthony Russo did throw the ball quite a bit, but you got to remember Temple, I think was, what were they worth? Like 96th in the FBS and passing offense coming in. So, um, right. so that was clearly a surprising credit to them for doing that. But, but let's be honest, the defense adjusted and got the job done. It, it tells you when this team creates turnovers, they have to. I mean, they really do have to create turnovers uh, to win. And, they, and you saw they did that in the second half. Uh, and when that when that happens, it, it gives them such a huge advantage because no matter what, that offense more often than not is going to put up six. Yeah, yeah. So as we come to Tuesday, um, while everyone else is paying attention to the elections, UCF was stuck back again at 12th in the latest – college football playoff uh, rankings. They are right behind Kentucky. And uh, Lopez, you actually had it up on uh, the site as well for the bowl projections. You're thinking it's going to be the Fiesta Bowl right now against Kentucky at the moment. And you got some sort of, some validation earlier today when, who was it, the the guys from the Peach Bowl actually said that? Yeah, one of the head guys from the Peach Bowl, the CEO and president of the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, Gary Stokin, said, quote, if the season ended today, we would have West Virginia and LSU in the Peach Bowl and Kentucky and UCF would meet in the Fiesta Bowl. That was a quote, and it, I agree. I think you know, I, part of the problem, if you want to have with the committee, is they have a. it's really them that pick now the bowl games because it's based yeah. on the rankings. It's no longer the bowl system, hey, we pick this or that. And I've said this, I, I, and I, I was told about this earlier in the year, the Peach Bowl doesn't want to have, quote-unquote, the Group of Five champion again. They've had them uh, this past year with UCF. They had it with Houston. The Fiesta Bowl hasn't had the Group of Five champion since Boise State in 2014, so they're kind of due. And the way the rankings are right now played out, uh, UCF would fall to the Fiesta Bowl. And I actually broke that down on the black and go banner at how the pick system would work uh, because that's the exact same matchup that I projected, West Virginia and LSU – uh, to play in the uh, peach, I believe I wrote. And then I had 
UCF and Kentucky because the way this would work is the Peach Bowl would take an LSU over at Kentucky as of now. They're higher ranked, obviously. So they would go to the Peach Bowl. Uh, they would be excited about that. It's a creative matchup. And while UCF drew very well in the Peach Bowl, let's be honest, if UCF's back in the Peach Bowl, I don't think they're going to draw as well as they did last year, uh, especially if they're playing Kentucky, which I've seen on social media, a lot of fans not happy about that potential yeah. matchup, lack of interest. But, um, you know, unfortunately now, I will say this, you know, if UCF were to continue to win and they move up, there's a chance that maybe the Peach Bowl would take them in that situation. But, yeah, I think we're staring at a Kentucky-UCF game, which is ironic because right now that's kind of the heart of the uh, outrage by a lot of UCF fans, that, and rightfully so, that they're still behind a Kentucky team that just lost their second game uh, to Georgia. I sensed, um, I want to know if you guys sensed this too, I sensed a little bit of a change in the rhetoric coming from UCF um, this week. And I wanted to mention this after the um, after the rankings. So Andy Seeley, who is a friend of ours, he's been a guest on the podcast before. He's Associate AD of Communications for UCF Athletics. When the rankings came down, uh, for the, I think it was the, uh, it was the, because the AP and the coaches had UCF going back one spot. Two to, spots. Or two they spots, excuse me, 11. you're right. Yeah, yeah, 9 to 11, dropping out of the top 10. And Andy posted this and tweeted it out. He said, um, you know, I know I said, this is Andy on Twitter, AG Seely is his handle. I know I said I wasn't going to concern myself with this stuff, but seriously, there are some people here who literally don't watch college football. There's just no other explanation. And uh, actually, oh no, this is the tweet that I wanted to read off to you. Said, Forget it, exclamation point. I'm just done concerning myself with the rankings. The double standards and glass ceilings are just too real. I'm just going to focus on doing my best to promote this team and its accomplishments and enjoy the ride. All right? This is the associate AD for communications. And... I was kind of like, okay. And, and I kind of sense this from a couple of other UCF accounts as well, UCF-related accounts. Just this sort of, uh, there's a sort of, th the thing that I was detecting was just sort of an air of, you know what, screw it. And, <laughs> and, and I wonder if you guys sense that too. And I'm curious. I, I hate ask. I, I hate, you know, talking about this, you know, I mean, Andy's not here to actually to actually defend himself on why he says it, but I, 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 I just, I'm just curious about the fact that you know why the sudden sort of change from like you know we're going to keep fighting, we're going to keep fighting to all of a sudden kind of, I'm sensing a little bit of not desperation, but a little, uh, but but a little bit of re being resigned, exhaustion, resi exhaustion yeah, yeah, resigned to your fate, sort of. What what do you guys think? Well, let's let's also like update that story. Like Andy hasn't stopped though. He's he's right. still tweeting about you see like right. it's not like he's completely off the issue. And he and he shouldn't be. I mean, in his job, uh he is really uh, a promoter. I mean, he 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 you know, does work to promote UCF football as as the the SID. Um so that's what he does. Uh but, you know, if you're going to ask me, and I think Eric, I don't want to put it words in Eric's mouth, but, I mean, we kind of been saying this for a while, right? Like, okay, I'm sorry if you're tired about this, but you didn't see this coming? <laughs> right. No, I mean, this well, is the system that it's always been. Yeah. I, let me say this, too. I, uh, I, I think at some point you have to just accept what it is but not let it affect it. I think what has happened here – you're on a 21 game win streak, and you're and people are ups, are miserable. Like our good friend Sam Unger is angry. He's upset. He's frustrated. That should not be the case. And I think part of the problem is there's way too many people worried about every single word that comes out of college game day, or what Joe Klatt says, or what this guy says, or especially what, that what guy Joel says. Klatt Who, says. <laughs> right? Who yeah. cares? Enjoy the fun here. Oh, they were winning 21 straight games. We're, let's worry about winning the games in front of you that you can control. Try to win a second consecutive conference title. Try to go undefeated for a second year in a row. Try to go to a major bowl game for a second year in a row. I mean, you're starting your, – your, your brand is better than ever.
Like, people are talking UCF consistently. Things are good. Let, you were never going to be in this playoff system. It was never going to happen. Why are you trying to let that affect how you feel about how things are going this season? This should be a celebration. It shouldn't be like, woe is us, and woe is me, and this is terrible. This is Who cares? We'll worry about it. You didn't care about it last year at the end of the year when you proclaim the national title. So guess what? You can proclaim another national title. Go to Disney. There's a lot of great things going on. And I think there's no reason to let it affect you from a negative standpoint. And I, and I, I applaud that. I want to um, put my tinfoil hat on for just a second and come oh. back to you, Eric, here. For just, right. just, just indulge me for a second. Um, all, right. all right. So we've got the Cincinnati game coming up. The yep. six day window was ex- was uh, exercised by ESPN for that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, a lot of games. Were. <laughs> let, well, yeah, that's true. Okay, but let us assume yeah. that UCF and Cincinnati get through that weekend, uh, get through this coming weekend unscathed. Are it, are the people in UCF's orbit trying to publicly sort of smooth out the red carpet for college game day to come for the Cincinnati game? Uh, I won't speak on their behalf. I've not spoken to any of them there, but I do know for a fact that they have been contacted by college game day. They're in the mix, as we have uh, I wrote about on blackandgoldbanneret.com. And I think, again, yes, I think part of this is as well as, look, let's, you know, this is a great opportunity if we can host game day. Now, they're head-to-head right now with the Notre Dame-Syracuse game, which is scheduled to be played at Yankee Stadium yep. uh, that Saturday. And there's been a lot of uh, uh, back and forth from what I've heard. You know, I there was some, you know, and, and I'll actually, you know, Brandon actually on UCSports.com reported this first about there are some logistical issues there about doing a show in, for example, in a Yankee Stadium. It's not your normal campus. It's not. So there are some logistics and fees and, and employees that have to be worked out. I mean, they did a show last year. Union shops, Times baby. Square. Union shops. That's what it's all about right there. Right. They did a show in <laughs> Times Square, and that was very expensive to do, uh, where you're hosting a show there that's not accustomed to. So that's an issue there from a permit standpoint and all that. Plus, I've been to the Bronx. Murph, have you been to the Bronx for a Yankee uh, game? Well, not in a new stadium, but I've, yes. I've, 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 been 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 to the new, I've been to the new stadium. Yeah. All all right. Is that the most friendliest uh, towns uh, of all time? <laughs> yeah. Not really. You know? of, I mean, of course, of course, as long as it, you're not wearing any Red Sox garb. I mean, right. It's, I mean, it's everybody friendly knows if you're this. wearing the NY. Yeah. Eh, it's an interesting town. Um, so there's some logistics. That being said, it's a big game as it stands. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, Syracuse moved up to, what, 13? They're right behind you, see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And you, you, Notre Dame's obviously right now number three in the country. I've heard, remember, that, that there's a big push to do the game day from there. First of all, it's Yankee Stadium, the the, the you know, Bronx. Notre Dame Syracuse. playing in Yankee Stadium, which is a tradition Correct. that goes back many, many years. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's not Syracuse. even though it's not that Yankee Stadium, it's you know. The, no, but anyway. Agreed. But you also have you would have the state of New York involved. Yeah. Uh, which is the number one media market in the country a market that normally doesn't give a crap about college football. So when you have an opportunity to push college football in that market, you do what you got to do. And I think there's some of that. And I've actually heard Jeff, that the athletic director of Syracuse is definitely pushing for game day to be there. Why that is significant because the athletic director at Syracuse used to be a higher up at boss at ESPN. Well, that's no surprise. Half of ESPN is made up of Syracuse graduates. Um, it, I mean, let's, <laughs> so let's be I, I honest here. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. And now we have to, I, I think, um, you know, games will be played. As if we record this, we haven't heard anything one way or the other. There's not been any speculation. I mean, ESPN, I could tell you this, they're very good as far as keeping it secret. Like, I mean, you would have, th- I mean, good luck trying to find any dots, you know. Yeah, they're so, not going to, they're, 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 they're not um, going to, yeah, they're not, like John, there's no dots to connect. Wild, <laughs> John Wildhack is the uh, athletic director at Syracuse. He was recently named the athletic director there uh, back in May. He was the, in, uh, I believe he was the vice president of uh, at ESPN. He had a yeah. high position there. He was a Q grad. That's why he took the AD job. But he's, he's a higher influence guy. So, um, as you mentioned, so I, I, you know, I think it's a toss up. I think it's 50 50. I think it's going to come down to it depends on the logistics. Can they pull off a show? A, from Yankee Stadium. Okay, outside of Yankee Stadium, because 
the whole purpose of the show is to do the show in front of with fans. Well, you're not going to do that if you're inside of a stadium. You can do that if it's outside the stadium, but can they do that? I don't know. That's one part of it. If that doesn't work, do they try maybe to do it at the campus of Syracuse, even though it's a technically a Notre Dame home game? I don't know. Uh, I think there's some logistics there they got to figure out. If they could sort it out, I think that's the game they will pick, assuming that Notre Dame and Syracuse win this Saturday, yeah. uh, this weekend. Now, Syracuse will play Friday night against Louisville. Notre Dame is playing Saturday night against Florida State. Both are heavy favorites and should win. Whereas UCF Don't rule out played- Syracuse blowing that. Anyway, by the way. Go ahead. Well, if you're used to, I mean, if you want game day in Orlando, <laughs> then root for Louisville. Right. I mean, all seriousness. I mean, you know, one of the great ironies of all time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the irony is if you want game day in Orlando to be sure, then either root for Syracuse to get upset or for Notre Dame to get upset uh, by Florida State uh, or root for a big snow blizzard, big snow to come in New York. So it makes it tough to do a show there. <laughs> and then come to Orlando where it's 80 degrees. Now, UCF's got to take care of their own business against uh, Navy, and then Cincinnati's got their own game against South Florida, even though I think that's not really as relevant because I think if they came to UCF, the storyline would be around UCF's uh, home uh, winning streak. Uh, yeah. So I don't think – here's the thing. If they're going to come to UCF, I think you'll hear about it Saturday night, early Saturday Well, that's night. usually when they announce it, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, if, if, if they want to go to New York, you may not hear it until late Saturday. I'm talking midnight or Sunday morning. If you don't hear anything by Sunday morning, then that tells you that Syracuse and Notre Dame are in play or that they haven't decided yet. Either. Interesting. Uh, by the way, well, it's a 40% I, chance of showers uh, Saturday, November 17th in New York City. That's good news for us. Let's hope that so, continues. So, yeah. um, so I think it's a toss-up there. I could see it go either way. And by the way, for all you people – if they pick Syracuse Notre Dame, it's not because it's a shot at UCF or it's not because they're afraid to come here. It's because it's a legitimate thing they want to do. It's a Yankee Stadium thing, a New York market thing with two teams in the top 13 in the country with playoff implications. So um, I see it going either way on that. And, yes, I do think you've noticed, I think UCF, they're, they're, that's where not you know you're not going to see any chit chat going on with ESPN yeah. at least not this week. I've just I've noticed I've practice. noticed that I, they turned it down from eleven. Yeah. So well, yeah. And I'll anyway. be honest, I wish they wouldn't have done it before. Well, either way, yeah. we're going to have to they find out. Have. There's a lot of moving parts to this still. We're going to find this out. Um, Navy is the next opponent, like we mentioned, uh, and coming up in a little bit, we're going to talk with uh, Mitch Nor- uh, Mitch Northern, who's uh, who covers Navy for against all enemies real quick brian uh any concerns coming into this game for ucf injury issues anything that people need to know about heading into this game well the, certainly if you watch temple game there were some injuries early in that game that uh, in which you know ucf had, had lost some critical pieces i think namely uh gabriel davis left early yeah uh tyler who tyler who Got rolled up on. It looked like he left. Pat Jasinski was hobbling around while he was on the field, and then he left. Milton got early. whacked around, too, in that game quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Number 10, uh, the quarterback got whacked around quite a bit. But uh, so anyway, but anyway, th- so to go through all that, uh, the ultimate there is that uh, Heupel said on Monday that uh, Jasinski and Davis and Hudanik are all ready to play this week against Navy. So that's good news. We talked to Milton about uh, taking his hit, taking the hits against Temple, coming back, and um, and taking those hits. And he said, you know, he took a, some good shots, but it's just part of the game. And he, you know, basically admitted that he's not going to be a hundred percent, you know, the rest of the year. I mean, he got hurt in the first game of the year against UConn. I think he sprained an ankle against UConn, and it just it's been it's been a, a you know a kind of a, a nagging injury season for him. And, uh, but that's the way it is. I mean, it's just football. Everybody gets hurt. Yeah, and everybody's McKenzie's hurt. No different. Everybody's hurt in November. <laughs> it's right. just a matter of, you know, what can you piece together so, to get things going. So, all right, so we should McKenzie, expect to see. I was worried about Gabe Davis. Right? That looked, that didn't look good. Right, exactly. So I, I, I thought it was interesting. I, I thought it was a little, I was a little surprised when Heibel said that they're all ready to go. But um, I'll, I'll take him at his word for it. Yeah. Well, the extra two days, I think, probably helped too since they played on the mm-hmm. Thursday night against Temple. So. All right, um, let's take a quick break. When we return, we'll have Mitch Northam from Against All Enemies, our 
SB Nation sister blog covering the uh, service academies. Joining us to talk uh, Navy midshipmen football uh, and the uh, and how the mids have struggled this year uh, under Ken Niamatololo. So we'll be right back in just a moment. This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Back after this. The Black and Gold Banneret Podcast is brought to you by Orlando Homes Express, brokered by EXP Realty. Sam Unger and his team at Orlando Homes Express proudly serve Orange, Seminole, and Lake Counties, specializing in buying, selling, and new construction. Sam is a very proud UCF graduate, class of 2006, and he's got a special deal going on right now for the 2018 UCF football season. Night fans, if you work with Sam to sell your home, he will list it for just 4.8% commission. And if you're buying a home with him, he will rebate you up to $750 at closing. So if you're ready to buy a new home or sell your current home, Upgrade or downsize, Sam and his team have you covered so you can find the right home at the right price in the right location. So give them a call right now at 407-790-9957. Again, that's 407-790-9957. Or visit them on the web at WeSellOrlando.net. Again, that's WeSellOrlando.net. You can also reach them on Facebook at Facebook.com slash we sell Orlando. Get in touch with Orlando Homes Express today and make finding your dream home a reality. Hello, Night Nation. I'm Andrew Fegley. And I'm Trey Strelko. Um, uh, um, where are we? This isn't our usual spot. It looks like we've landed in the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Oh, yeah. I've, I've heard of those guys. You know, Nightline has UCF sports covered. Week in and week out, we bring you interviews with newsmakers and in-depth analysis of UCF sports. Subscribe to our weekly podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to Nightline on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Nightline. Trace, can we go back to the 1148 studios now and start working on our next all-new Nightline? How do we get out of here? Go Knights! Charge on! Now back to you guys in the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast, blackandgoldbanneret.com, part of the SB Nation Network. You can follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret and on Facebook at facebook.com slash blackandgoldbanneret. And if you don't already subscribe to this podcast, you can at uh, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and TuneIn. All right, let's dive in with our preview of the Navy game coming up at noon uh, on ESPN2, UCF and the Midshipmen. Uh, remember, UCF defeated Navy last year in Annapolis in uh, a game that was a lot more dramatic than probably UCF people uh, would have preferred. Um, but things are a little bit different for Navy uh, this time around. And joining us now, Mitch Northam. He writes for Against All Enemies, which is also part of the SB Nation Network, one of our sister sites. In fact, uh, a very close sibling of ours. They just joined the SB Nation Network uh, right the same time we did. And uh, Mitch covers uh, Navy football for uh, Against All Enemies. He also writes for Pro Soccer USA, uh, Mid Major Madness, another SBN site, and High Post Hoops, amongst many, many other places. Mitch, thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. Uh, looking, looking forward to it. Looking forward to talking football. We've got uh, well, here we are in uh, in uh, early November, and this game suddenly takes on tremendous significance for UCF, but not as much significance uh, for Navy as maybe people thought at the start of the year. The mids are uh, struggling this year, two and seven uncharacteristic season for uh, Ken Niamatololo's crew. They started 2-1, and one, beat Memphis by one point. Things were looking pretty good, but then a one-point overtime loss at SMU, and things have just fallen apart. Last time out, they lost uh, 42-0 at Cincinnati. Um, well, for those of us here in Orlando who maybe don't follow Navy as closely as you do, what in the world is going on in Annapolis? <laughs> I think uh, when the you know when the schedule came out, um, I think there were a lot of Navy fans that kind of looked at this game uh, as you know kind of one that you know Navy might be competitive in and might even you know win and it might be kind of a crucial part in the season. Um, you know, depending on you know whether or not they you know maybe had a win streak going or you know they'd have to rebound from a, a close loss to Notre Dame or something like that. But uh, yeah, you know, it started out, um, you know, with the season opening loss to Hawaii and then, uh, 
Um, you know, they beat Lehigh, which, you know, cupcake game, you know, definitely should have beat them. And then they beat Memphis. And I think based off of last year, what we saw out of Memphis, a lot of people, you know, we, we kind of got, got high hopes about that game. Okay, if they beat Memphis, then they should go on and, and do some good things this season. Um, but, you know, Memphis hasn't been quite what they were last year. And, and yeah, Navy's just kind of falling apart. Um, it's, I don't know, it just kind of comes down to they're just not executing and they're just making mistakes. Um, I, I think on offense, you know, they uh, they're kind of lacking some consistency, especially at the quarterback position. Seems like there's somebody new in there every week. We've seen Malcolm Perry um, start the season under center. We've seen Garrett Lewis some, um, and now it seems like they've gone back to Zach Abey, who um, started the season a wide receiver, um, and he was pretty enthusiastic about you know the position switch and kind of willing to do whatever. Um, but I think he is maybe happy to be back under center, but you know, he was back under center for, for most of last week's game against Cincinnati. Um, and you know, that ended in a blowout loss. Um, and Navy, I don't think had been shut out since 2012 or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just not, uh, definitely not going the way that, um, you know, <clears throat> coach Ken and everybody wanted to this season. Um, they're, you know, missing assignments on defense. I mean, one of their big problems is they, they've been turning the ball over a lot, which is usually not something that Navy does. I mean, it, it seems like every week they have at least two turnovers. Um, and usually, you know, the way that Navy and kind of some of these service academies wins football games is kind of grinding possessions out, um, you know, using that triple option and, um, you know, really just keeping the other team off the field, taking care of the football. Um, and Navy just hasn't done that this year. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I, I, th I think overall it's just kind of, um, you know, the mistakes and the missed assignments and the mixed executions just kind of piling up. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, they're, uh, two and seven, um, they're not going to make a bowl game. Um, so I think at this point they're just playing for pride. Um, but it's really rare to, you know, to kind of see this in the Ken Niamakuo era, um, he's been at Navy, I think this is his ninth season, um, and he's only had, this will this will only be his second losing season there. Um, every other season he's taken Navy to a bowl game. So, um, you know, yeah, definitely rare to see this out of uh, the the mids in Annapolis. Yeah, first time I think you said since 2011 that Navy <clears throat> is not going to go to a bowl game. Now you mentioned um, the quarterback situation and just the flux that Navy's been in this year. Now last year in the game against UCF, the Knights came in ranked 20th in the country. Uh, six and zero at that time. Navy was five and two, and this was a real showdown at Annapolis. And Zach Ab was, uh, well, to put it lightly, he was a real problem <laughs> for UCF. Mm -hmm. um, he had tw he had 126 yards uh, on 25 carries on the ground and a touchdown. He also was two of four through the air, but had a long touchdown pass. Which I mean, that's that's what Navy does. But um, you mentioned that they've switched between uh, three quarterbacks between Garrett Lewis. Uh, Malcolm Perry and Zach Aby. Looks like they've. It looks like uh, Coach Ken has settled on Zach Aby for now. But um, do you expect that to continue, or might we see one or two of the other guys on Saturday against UCF? Yeah, I'm not sure. To be honest with you, it seems like Aby has the job for now. Um, but I guess that that could certainly change. I think kind of the idea of you know why um, Ken went to. Malcolm Perry over AB in the first place was kind of somebody I, you know, he went to AB first because AB is kind of that traditional option quarterback. I mean, for the most part, he's going to run the ball and he's pretty good at that. Uh, but he can also sling it, you know, a little bit, you know, well enough to where, you know, there's that at least threat of passing there, but towards the end of last season, um, <clears throat> you know, AB just wasn't really consistent with um, throwing the ball at all. Um, and, it, you know, Malcolm Perry was just more, a more dynamic of a of a runner and, and just better at kind of running the option. Um, so I think that was maybe kind of the idea going into this season was, um, you know, they switched A.B. to wide receiver. They were going to have Malcolm, you know, run the option for the most part. But then they put A.B. in on like these goal line situations because he's, you know, almost twice uh, Malcolm Perry's size. Malcolm Perry's a little guy. I mean, he's he's pretty uh you know, dynamic when he gets into open space, but in those kind of short yarded situations. Um, so they got kind of a little bit predictable. I mean, they would put AB in when it was a passing situation or if it was a goal line situation. And I think maybe that kind of, 
you know, that, like I said, that made a Navy's offense a little bit predictable, um, which was kind of hard to defend at some point, but yeah. So, um, you know, Malcolm got hurt at some point this season. Um, I think he's, you know, healthy for the most part. Now, um, they went to Garrett Lewis a little bit and it seemed like he kind of had the job locked up, but then, you know, didn't really have a great game, um, against Notre Dame. So they went to AB. Um, yeah, so it seems right now that AB is the guy. Um, you know, he had a great game against UCF last year. Um, I think I, um, yeah, I just looked it up earlier. Um, he had 115 yards passing, 126 yards on the ground, two touchdowns. So, I mean, if AB can kind of replicate that performance from last year, um, which is easier said than done, of course, um, you know, UCF's a pretty damn good football team, as we've seen, you know, last year and this year. Um you know, if he can replicate that performance, then, you know, maybe maybe has a chance to make this a ball game. Um, yeah. But like I said earlier, I mean, the other thing that they have to do is just take care of the football. Um, I guess the good thing for Navy is that, you know, the one area where UCF hasn't been great this year is rushing defense. Um, I think they're, you know, close to the bottom, maybe like 93rd or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so allowing almost 200 yards per game on the ground. So that's, you know, Navy's a run first team, obviously, with the triple option. So. You know, if they can get that going early, then maybe we kind of see a little bit of a recipe for for an upset and, and give uh, UCF fans some worry. <laughs> yeah, well, I, Navy comes in. These are actually, interestingly enough, these are two of the top six uh, rushing teams in the country. Navy, obviously, right. third to at about 287 a game. Uh, although you're right, UCF's run defense has been quite bad. But if they hold, if they hold Navy to whatever average that, um, that UCF is holding them to, I think they'd be pretty I think UCF would probably actually be pretty happy with that um oh, but, sure, yeah. yeah when you look at um and a funny part about last year's game too was AB got hurt in that game and and that well actually before that his touchdown pass was a 75 yarder to Malcolm Perry mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then AB got hurt and then Lewis came in and it, with UCF up 24-21, um, Brandon Moore had a huge hit, read the option perfectly, caused a turnover. UCF was able to cash in on that turnover and pretty much wrap up the game. But, um, but yeah, I, I, at least over on the UCF side, there are definitely some concerns about um, the Knights' rush defense, especially after, you know, what Memphis has done to UCF and also what Temple, to a certain extent, uh, did to the Knights as well. Let me ask you about Ken Niamatololo because, uh, like you said, there's uh, – Navy's about to have only their second uh, sub-500 season under him this year. And uh, there's a job opening not far away in College Park at the University of Maryland. And um, I don't know to what extent this there's any smoke to that, or, or there's any fire to that smoke, but is there a possibility that Ken Niamatolo may move on from Navy this year? Um, uh, so I suppose, I mean, there's always a possibility. Um, <clears throat> I would say that, um, you know, with Maryland or with any other power five job, um, any other power five school that wants to, you know, court Ken Niamatololo, I mean, the one thing that you have to guarantee is that, you know, you, I mean, you have to become a triple option school. Um, you can't, you know, you're not going to hire Ken Niamatololo to run, you know, something else. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of the thing that we have with Paul Johnson, you know, kind of a decade ago. Now, Georgia Tech, I mean, they made that decision, you know, to be kind of the triple option team of the ACC. And I think for the most part, it's kind of worked out well for them. I mean, Georgia Tech was never going to, you know, be, you know, kind of some of these other teams in the ACC. You know, they were never going to compete annually with, you know, the Florida States and the Clemsons and stuff like that. I mean, you weren't going to beat them just, you know, we're going to recruit better than, than those schools. I mean, that was never going to happen. Um, so they kind of went to the triple option route and they've recruited specific players for that system. And I think they have, um, you know, one under Paul Johnson's tenure. I mean, I think they have one ACC um, championship under their belt. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're competitive most years, um, every, every, every couple of years, I mean, they make a pretty good bowl game. So it's kind of, it, it's really up to, I guess, the athletic administration and, and the football, um, situation, you know, with any power five school, including Maryland. I mean, if you want to make that commitment to say, all right, we're going to be the triple option team of the big 10, and we're going to surprise some people and people are going to have to put a lot of game planning into us every year. And, you know, 
most years we're going to go, you know, we're going to hover a little bit above 500, but some years, you know, we might be up there, you know, in the mix for maybe championship game or something like that. Um, for Maryland, I don't think that idea is crazy because you haven't really been a good football team since you fired uh, Ralph Friesen. Um, I think that was at the end of 2009 or 2010. They hired Randy Edsel. That didn't work out. And we've seen kind of the, the mess that DJ Durkin has created there. Um, but they, I mean, they haven't been good. Um, you know, I can't remember the last time that Maryland was really in the national conversation for anything good for football. So maybe that is the move for them. Maybe if you're Maryland, you say, all right, you know, we'll, we'll be the triple option team and we'll, uh, you know, I mean, you have a great recruiting area right there in the, in, in the, in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, you know, the DMV. Um, you know, there's tons and tons of recruits there. Most of the time, Maryland is getting out recruited for those players because they kind of play a system that a lot of, you know, schools play. But, you know, if they make a move to the triple option um, and they make a move to Kenny and Matalolo, maybe you can get, you know, some of those players. You know, you can get that that guy um, who's really athletic and wants to play quarterback. Um, but Ohio State wants to turn him into a safety. Um, you know, you can get that guy to come play quarterback for you at Maryland. Um, so it, it, I, I guess there's there's that thing that you know that that would be the big thing for Ken to be lured away from Navy. I think I think he has a ton of job security at Navy. Like like we talked about before, you know, he's made seven bowl games. He's only had two losing seasons. I think he could coach there for the rest of his life if he wants to. Um, the other thing is he is really good friends with Ivan Jasper, um, who is Navy's offensive coordinator. It seems to me that Ivan wants a head coaching job at some point. Um, so you kind of wonder if maybe Ken thinks about that in the back of his head. You know, hey, maybe I should kind of get out of the way and, you know, maybe let Ivan take over the reins here at Navy or something. Um, or, you know, maybe Ivan goes somewhere else and gets a job. Maybe Maryland you know, makes the move and, and hires Ivan Jasper. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be the big thing with with Navy or I mean with Ken, um, you know, that power five school would have to make that commitment to running his system and being committed to him for, you know, a few years for him to kind of get it developed and get the ball rolling. I think the one thing you can guarantee is, you know, you're never going to have any scandal or anything like this DJ Durkin situation. You know, if you hire a coach like Kenny Mazzalolo, um, you're going to be competitive every year. Um, as we've seen at Navy, you know, I mean, I, I think more than any coach in the country, um, Ken has over the past nine years done more with less in terms of talent, um, you know, kind of getting getting guys in the system and finding out where they fit and and doing good things with them. But, you know, it, it is hard for some power five schools to kind of make that commitment to the triple option. I think you saw I think it was last year, or the year before, um, you know, Ken kind of flirted with uh, Arizona State there. Um, for a little bit, or Arizona. Arizona. Yeah, Arizona, yeah, I think. Arizona, right. yeah, and, uh, you know, their quarterback kind of came out on Twitter and was like, I didn't come here to run the triple option. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, what it's kind of up to, up to you know, the Power 5 school. I mean, is Arizona ever going to, you know, compete for a Pac-12, you know, Pac Pac-10 uh, title? I mean, maybe, um, you know, under, under their current uh, setup, but... You know, I think if you make that commitment to the triple option, you kind of see what, what Georgia Tech has kind of done over the past decade with Paul Johnson. You know, they've been competitive most seasons. You know, are they going to be ranked in the top 10, you know, every year? No. Um, but, you know, every now and then they're going to have a really good team that's going to be able to compete for a conference championship. And um, they're going to pull off some big upset wins. And, you know, they're going to they're going to be competitive. So, you know. It, it just kind of depends on what you want. Um, but yeah, I think certainly Ken can be lured away from, from Navy. I mean, like I said, he, he talked with Arizona last year. Um, in the past, he's talked with BYU. Um, so yeah, I, I think if, if the right situation comes along and it's for the right money and that school wants to be committed to him and running the triple option, then yeah, certainly um, we could see him, him move on from Navy. And, and if he ever does move on, you know, within this year and next year, I think Navy would almost certainly just move Ivan Jasper up to head coach. So uh, last question for you. UCF is favored by 25 in this game. The over under 63. That sound about right to you? Yeah, that's, uh, that seems about right, especially considering, you know, what happened to Navy last week, um, you know, getting shut out by Cincinnati, which I think was a shock to, you know, everyone. I mean, Navy just usually – doesn't get shut out. They usually don't get blown out. Um, I, I think it's possible that 
I, I would hope as, you know, just kind of someone who kind of roots for Navy and, and watches them a lot that they would come out in this game. I think it's kind of typical of the Kenny and Matalolo teams to, you know, rebound from big losses like that and to come out, you know, playing a little sharper and trying to go for something. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think Navy's going to win this game, but I, I think it could be surprisingly close, um, you know, just based on kind of, you know, the, the fight that these that Ken's teams usually have. Yeah, I'm never going to be surprised by that, especially this year with UCF. All right. Uh, where can uh, folks reach out to you if they want to follow a little bit more about uh, Navy football and all the things that you do? Sure. Well, uh, yeah, if you want to read about Navy football and Army football and Air Force football um, and all the sports at the service academies, you can go to againstallenemies.com. That's SB Nation's new service academies blog. Um, and if you want to follow me and everything that I'm doing, um, you can – head over to Twitter and type in primetime Mitch and you'll be able to find me, or you can probably just search my name too, uh, Mitchell Northam. Um, so yeah, I'm on Twitter and writing about, uh, football and basketball and soccer and a bunch of other things. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's where you, you guys can find my work, but, uh, yeah, definitely check out, um, SB nation's blogs at, uh, at against all enemies and, and, and the UCF site as well. Sounds good. All right, Mitch Northam from uh, Against All Enemies. We appreciate it, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us here on the Black and Gold Banner podcast, and uh, we'll be catching you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, thanks to uh, Mitch once again. His uh, Twitter handle is Primetime Mitch, which is an all time great Twitter handle, by the way. Um, and you can also follow uh, Against All Enemies at A A E underscore S B N. Again, that's A A E underscore SBN. They cover all of the uh, service academies and they are our sister blog and actually in more ways than one guys because they actually signed on with SB Nation the same time that we did. Um, they started that blog from scratch. Meanwhile, we ca- they kind of, you know, brought us under the fold. But um, but yeah, here they are. Uh, so uh, we want to thank them for their uh, opportunity uh, for for their um, graciousness and thank Mitch for his time as well. All right. Uh, real quick, boys, let's do predictions for this game. So uh, UCF and Navy. Noon kickoff uh, at uh, at Spectrum Stadium. Um, UCF obviously won the game last year uh, in a very tight game. This is a different Navy team, though, coming in at, at 2-7. and seven. Uh, It is a 25-point, 5-point line in favor of UCF. Boy, oh, boy, I haven't seen a line that big, actually, in a while. Um over under 63. Um, Murph, I'll start with you. What do you think? Uh, uh, cover and over or under? I uh, am taking both. I'm taking both the, the cover and the and the over. Uh, I think I said on uh, – I was on C. Austin Cox's uh, show today on the AAC Daily Show. And ah, a little, think... little promo drop right there. I like well, it. I it, like it. It's, it's, Carry it's, on. You know, it's – it, it it does bleed into what I'm going to say. I think he also asked me for a prediction for this game, and considering that Navy just got shut out by Cincinnati 42 nothing, uh, and given UCF's uh, early problems on defense in in basically every game this season, uh, I said 49 17, which which would give you both the over and UCF covering at 25 and a half. Eric. Yeah, UCF's covering this easily. Come on. I mean, Navy, <laughs> Navy's, I mean, I'm sorry. They're terrible. You you obviously recapped that in the interview. Uh, they look terrible against Cincinnati. By the way, I, let, me, let me read this because I just got this on text. Okay. I've been trying to. Uh, this just came in from a buddy of mine up in the Northeast. So John Wildhack mentioned the AD of Syracuse, was on ESPN Syracuse up there uh, earlier this week. On the uh, radio station up there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would know more about that, Jeff. You went up there. I didn't, you know, yeah. It's, that's it's what changed I a few about. times, but I know a few of the guys up there, yeah. Uh, he said that he believes Syracuse Notre Dame uh, he is on the short list of potential college game day sites. He also mentioned that UCF Cincinnati will be their com- main competition. Uh, he did add that when he was at ESPN, he always pushed college game day to go to the Northeast. That's the influence I referenced earlier. Uh, that's to me the biggest hurdle right there. Um, well, that, well, it, you know that, that's the interesting thing. Now again, it'd be great to do shows in Northeast, but is it? Uh, you know, is it? You know, can it work? And you know, you have to have uh, permits. You have to. There are certain logistics you have to sort out. 
Um, it's, but that's uh, what John Wildhack said on the radio up there. So take that for what it's worth. That kind of confirms. And, and, you know, UCF has been contacted. And game day, I, what I've been told from people that have hosted, usually reaches out to two to three schools uh, two weeks prior to say, hey, we might come there. That, that way they have an idea of what they can work with. Um, so I'm sure that game day people or ESPN reached out to UCF. Hey, we might come to your game against Cincinnati. What is your setup like? What do you think we could do? And I'm sure that UCF has sent out some proposals of, hey, if you guys come here, this is how you, you could set up here or you could set up there. And I'm sure that game day people are talking to the people in New York to see what the what the logistics and the possibilities are of doing college game day at Yankee Stadium. I think they're working on that as we speak. And when they come to that decision remains to be seen. And what, uh, you know, and, and that's so that that's the interesting. That's what I just got. Keep an eye on College Game Day's Twitter account on Saturday night. That's what and that's going to be myself, about. myself. I will trust me. I will be uh, tweeting out as I hear more stuff uh, uh, if that goes on. By the way, interesting note here. Okay. Are you ready for this? All right. He also said that if Syracuse wins out, he thinks they'll go to the Peach Bowl uh, and play maybe either an SEC team or UCF. Whoa. All right. If Sir, if Syracuse – all right. It, now, all right, I know why you brought that up. All right. So for those of you yeah. who haven't the heard Jeff it, Sheriff who don't know Bowl, this, yeah. Um, Jeff, I am an alum Jeff, of both your, schools. Your allegiances are torn. Um, I am an alum of both schools. I, I got my undergraduate degree from UCF. I got my graduate deg- degree from Syracuse. I've uh, – man, if that, if that happens I, – I don't care what bowl it is. I don't care if they send Syracuse and UCF out to the Fiesta Bowl. I'm going. Right. I'm going, man. I mean, that's oh man, that would be something. Now, All right. For them to win out, they would have to upset Notre Dame. Well, don't rule it out. Don't rule it out. That would also really also, help. That would also help UCF. I, to be honest with you, <laughs> they're also so. pushing for a huge crowd for Friday night against Louisville. That's, I guess, their big push yeah. over there. So they're at, uh, at the dome. So I will say this about the Navy game: it should be a blowout. But here's the concern, and you brought this up. I, I don't remember if you brought it up on social media or or, or not. I think you did. It was social media on Twitter. If UCF defensively does not do a better job against the run, uh, like they did, I mean, Temple ran over them with Armstead. And, I, and I'll say this, if Armstead doesn't, if he plays that fourth quarter, who knows? That might well, be a different game. Well, go back and look at the Memphis game tape. <laughs> I right. mean, that was bad enough. Will, right. So I will say this, if they don't get, you know, you could talk about how great of adjustments they do in the second half, but they need to do a better job in the first half because I think part of the reason why they dropped or didn't move up is because I think the entire country and the committee watched them on Thursday night give up 34 points in the first half. And while you could say, well, so did Oklahoma this, you had the national spotlight, and sometimes that comes as a negative, as a curse, if you don't look that great. And they yeah. got to do a better job of that. And if they don't, if Navy can run the football and, chew, and shorten this game, it might be closer than we think if they don't shore that up. I will say that. Well, I mean, the one thing about Navy that we know, and we knew that from talking to Mitch, is that you know what's you know what's coming, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. No Scott Frost to uh, to play uh, to play scout team uh, quarterback. So, um, you know, well, I don't know who who, who I wonder I, that would I, I would be curious about that. Uh, who played the part of Scott Frost playing the part of the uh, the Navy quarterback? So, Maybe it was Heupel. Who knows? Well, Maybe it was. Know, well, think... Heupel didn't run the option. Uh, and I don't think did it he? was not Heupel. It was not Heupel. So. Oh, it was, I, I, no, I mean, he was asked this actually on Monday about if he had any experience in the triple option in a triple option offense and kind of seemed surprised that he was asked such a question. Oh, he but, shouldn't have been. Come on, Josh. Did also, but he did also say that when he was in high school, he ran the option uh, when I think his father, I think he was being coached by his father. That's correct. Uh, but so, you know, but yes, he ran it way, way back, but, you know, not in any sort of recent time. I would probably guess that Quadri Jones, uh, famous this season for throwing a double pass touchdown to Adrian Killen at East Carolina, he's probably your scout team quarterback this week. Yeah, it's like riding a bike. I mean, you just pick it up, you know, all of a sudden you got it. You never really forget how to run the triple option. Anyway. Do you, <laughs> right. Do you, do you agree with me, though? I think it's important they shore that up right away. Like, take it right from the first quarter, because if they can do that, then I think this will be an easy game. But if they struggle, and, and, you, and you see Navy gashing them and having five, six-minute drives, then – all of a sudden, we might have a game that goes into the second half and into the fourth quarter. Well, Maybe. I, think, I mean, I, yeah. I think the margin of victory is very important. It's always important, right? Because these, these, you know, 
at, at that noon time, no one's going to really watch. Not a lot of people are going to really watch, you know, UCF and Navy. They're going to look at the final score. So I think it's a, a game where if UCF's ahead 42 nothing in the fourth quarter, that's great. But if Navy all of a sudden makes it 42-21 and whatever, it's meaningless points, but they only lost by 21, whereas Cincinnati won by 42, they're going to look at that and compare them both and say, well, UCF wasn't as impressive, even though they didn't watch a second of the game. Well, you know what? Um, I'm going to I'm gonna quote our guy Luke Saris. Just keep winning. Yeah, Luke. <laughs> Just keep winning. Savage yeah. Luke has been has been pounding it on Twitter, man. He's been all up. He's been all up in Joel Class business. It's been great. Yeah, I think Joel enjoys that, though. That's the problem. I yeah, think Joel I, loves yeah. The I, I think he's excited. He's making yeah, Joel, Joel is, money. Joel the troll yeah. is uh, is uh, certainly enjoying that. All right. Um, all right. So we've got Na- uh, Navy and UCF noon kickoff. And that game is on. Uh, what's what's the TV on that, Eric? Is it ESPN two at ESPN noon? ESPN two at noon. Uh, okay, so good time slot. You know, not too bad. So very much, considering how bad Navy's been this year, yeah, I thought for sure this would be an ESPN U game. I knew it was going to be a day game, either noon yeah. or three thirty. But uh, the fact they got ESPN two, I think it's good. Um, so you know, they'll they'll get a decent audience, and uh, Nate, you know, we'll see how it goes. Going for twenty two in a row, UCF has. Uh, and trying for their uh, trying for another win against Navy. So, um, all right, let's talk uh, Olympic sports before we get out of here because this is a tremendous. We have a little week. thing called hoops. Well, <laughs> we'll get, we to, get we'll, to the end. We'll That's get to, we'll save important. that to the end because because listen, they they just started their season and hoops and all that stuff. But I wanted to first of all UCF women's soccer. We're going to start with them. That their season came to an end um, this past uh, this past weekend with uh, falling in the. American Athletic Conference uh, semifinals to Memphis, uh, and the uh, Knights were not selected. Uh, is that right, Eric? That the selection show is on Monday. Correct. Yes. So, so they were not selected to go to the tournament as an at-large. Uh, UCF season, and I mean, it was really just boy that game against Memphis was just a microcosm of the whole season. Uh, they finished ten seven and one. They had ten wins once again under Tiffany Roberts Sahadak, but and the three nothing went over Temple. In the quarters, but against Memphis, they, um, you know, on Friday, uh, they gave up a goal um, in the uh, in what was it, eighty first minute, uh, off yeah, of a header, and minute. and I mean, what I mean, what can you possibly do? I mean, it's it's just been uh, bad luck after bad luck after bad, and they well, had a goal and, taken you know, away they, from them too on an yes. offside call too, didn't they earlier? Which I thought it was a bad call. Which I thought it was a bad call. I thought she was on side. I think it was Kristen Scott. I might want to say it was Scott. Yeah, Scott actually one. had a goal that was right? taken away. And I thought and I looked at it. I didn't see it live. I saw it on re- uh, highlights because I was uh, covering a Magic game. I remember watching it because uh, I was talking to someone that was watching the game, and I saw that play. And I'm like, she's on side. It's a bad call. Um, you know, people complain about you know that's unfortunate uh, that had uh, and happens in soccer because that obviously could have changed things around. Unfortunately. They needed to win the tournament to get in. The RPI yeah. was just too high, and they weren't going to get in as an at-large. And I think they'll look back, and they'll look back at the East Carolina loss at overtime at home, the overtime loss, uh, the loss to SMU at home. If they win those two matches, they win the regular season title. They have a completely different draw, and maybe, you know, they wouldn't. You know, they might have still played Memphis or USF in the final. Maybe it would have been a different result. They actually played Memphis better than South Florida did in the championship game. So it was yeah. tough to, you know, they had to play the extra match. Um, and it was just one of those things. They just did never click. They had some injuries. They never had the full squad. They were just too inconsistent. And as softball learned in the spring, when you're inconsistent, uh, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get in, especially with an RPI. I think it was like 60 or something like yeah, that. Somewhere in the, in. somewhere in the high sixties, I think it was like 68, yeah, somewhere yeah. around there. So, so it's a bummer. You know, UCF women's soccer will not go to the NCAA uh, tournament this year, even though they had quite a talented, I still I still maintain that th- it all got started with that that first match against Florida Gulf Coast getting wiped before they went up to Chapel Hill because of the rain, and uh, that was a that was a bummer because they could have gotten one game under their belt against a team that actually turned out to be pretty good this year, and and it just it just kind of all came apart from there. All right, but their counterparts on the men's side, Eric Lopez, um, what a year it has been once again. Twelve two and two, they finished the regular season. With a one nothing win uh, against Cincinnati, uh, that clinches the American Athletic Conference uh, a, a cha- a regular season championship for the Knights. Uh, Derek Warden, by the way, had a phenomenal photo gallery from 
from that game. And if you haven't seen it yet on our site on blackandgoldbanneret.com, you got to check it out. Thanks again to Derek, who's just an f- incredibly talented photographer, and um, and the job he did with that was really awesome. But they uh, so UCF is the one seed; they get to host the tournament, and they get a bye to the second round. Remember, it's it's a six team tournament this year instead of four in previous years. And the Knights uh, will play uh, UConn, uh, who uh, defeated who was it? Was it Memphis? I think that they beat, that they knocked off. It was. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Temple. They beat Temple three to one in the on Tuesday at UCF. Uh, that match was tied at one, and UConn scored two late goals to uh, to uh, put it away. But UCF faces UConn on the American Digital Network Thursday night, seven p.m. Uh, the one versus the four uh, in the American. On the other side of the bracket, it's the two SMU who also had a bye against the six seed Memphis. Um, but this game against yeah, UConn. USF. Yeah, Memphis yeah. at USF. That was the big one there. Uh, the Bulls are out uh, on that one. The out UCF, early. Well, that's a tough draw with UConn. That is a tough draw. Yeah. Those two teams they went draw, to uh, went to a scoreless draw the only yeah. time that they met back on October the 12th, too. And that was, that was at home for UCF as well when both teams were ranked there, too. Correct. And that was a battle for first. UConn was in the lead. Uh, up until they lost to SMU, and then they kind of dropped another one to drop all the way to the four spot. They are good. I mean, this is a tough draw in the semifinal. The good news is UConn had to play those 90 minutes, so you think UCF is a little fresher uh, mm-hmm. come Thursday night. But this will be a battle. This will be a battle for sure. And they, if they win this conference tournament, they will have earned it because they'll probably have to, they'll have to go through UConn, and more than likely they'll have to go through SMU again. And that'll be uh, a tough and, you know, UCF's going to be in in the NCAA tournament regardless what happens here after winning the regular season title for the first time, a conference title since 04 a Sun. Uh, their RPI is in the t- low teens. Yep, they're 13 ranked. RPI. So they're going to be in. And they're going to host an NCAA tournament game probably, by the way, on that weekend of the Cincinnati game. I mean, yeah. just think about that for a second. Uh, I mean, we've already got a busy week on campus with homecoming this week. I mean, they could, they're going to be hosting. The question is, how many matches could they potentially host? And I think if they were to win this tournament, that could increase the chances of them maybe hosting multiple matches at home instead of maybe just the first round. Yeah, that would be a huge advantage for UCF. Like you said, 13 RPI. UConn's RPI, by the way, is 24th. Um, in the United Soccer Coaches poll, UCF has jumped all the way up to 7th. Number 7 That's in right, the country. Baby. And... Uh, and uh, uh, Let's see, we have UConn. Where's UConn? They're not even ranked, which is kind of surprised. They're in the receiving votes category. They're receiving 12 votes, but and SMU is also receiving votes. But but the Knights, man, seventh in the country behind. All right, number one, Wake Forest. Two, Indiana. Three, Kentucky. Four, North Carolina. Five, St. Mary's of California. Six, Stanford. Knights are ahead of Duke, Denver, and Louisville. So... Man, I, I, it, all the all the yapping we've been doing about football learn, turns out it's the other football that's been actually climbing the rankings. Granted, it's the United Soccer coaches that doesn't have really much of an impact on um, where teams are for the NCAA tournament, but it has certainly not as much as the RPI. But number seven in the country, that's been the highest ranking. I don't know, is that the highest ranking for UCF soccer ever? I don't think so. I think men and the men have been that high before, way back in the day. But I'll have to double check with. Uh, I have to double check with Kelly on that, but um, but yeah, number seven in the country, and a chance to see this team on Thursday night. By the way, if they get through UConn, the championship match for the American Athletic Conference will be Saturday, same day as the football game. Um, Saturday night. Saturday night, seven p.m. at the at the soccer complex. It'll be televised on ESPN three, so it'll be over the over the um, over the stream. Um, the semifinal game is televised on the American Digital Network, which uh, you can find at theamerican.org. dot uh, org. But, but yeah, that would be a busy Saturday football at noon against Navy. Three and a half hours. Let's see, three thirty, four. Get out of there four thirty. Grab a bite to eat. Head on over to the soccer game. That's what I did last year when I <laughs> was a football game, and then I went to the women's NCAA tournament. So. Uh, that's definitely not too bad. By the way, the selection show, mm-hmm. uh, I believe it'll be on Monday. It'll be on Monday. So all right, we'll know on Monday where they uh, what their uh, scenario, where will be. and when and who. So 
and that and that ranking is the highest ranking in program history. Okay, seven. Oh, there you go. Man. Murph, drop it. Murph off the top I, rope, baby. I, I know many of you think I just disappear and hang <laughs> up when this is all going on, but rest assured, I still listen to this podcast as all of you should. <laughs> all right, so let's so let's really test your knowledge. Volleyball. Brian Murphy. I gotta hang up. I'm kidding. Nah, nah. I really you want to you want to be here for this because yes, um, the it. streak continues. 19 yeah. wins in a row. The Knights are undefeated in conference at 13 and 0, 12 and 0 at home. Last week, um, they did the uh, Northeastern road trip. They uh, swept UConn in stores. They beat Temple in a hard fought four set match in Philly. And now they come back five matches to go in the regular season. This is the final full home weekend where you get two matches. Uh, Friday night, 7 p.m. against Cincinnati. Rematch of the match from earlier this year where UCF won in five. And that was where they actually, um, you know, following that match, they bumped up into the top 25, uh, into the coaches' top 25. And then East Carolina on Sunday at one. But that Cincinnati match is key, and here's why. Like I said, five matches to go. And UCF, should they finish, should they defeat Cincinnati, they would be effectively three matches ahead of them in, in, the, uh, in the conference. Cincinnati is 11 and 2 in the league, 21 and 6 overall. The Knights are 22 and 3, 13 and 0. You win that match, you go 14 and 0 and drop Cincy to 11 and, uh, 11 and 3. And that's with four matches to go. Then if you beat East Carolina, who right now is twelve and twelve overall, four and nine in the conference. Um, you you could by the end of the weekend clinch at least a share of the conference championship, um, which is really something when you think about it. I, how far this team has gone with this with this roster full of freshmen and sophomores and one senior, Jordan Pingle, who is mm-hmm. who is winning the Defensive Player of the Week award in the American every week now. It's a, it's about time they did that for her since I don't think she had won one in the previous three years that she'd been out there. So um, I guess they're making up for missed opportunities. But then it's one road weekend at SMU in Texas, at SMU and then at Houston, and then home the day before Thanksgiving for USF to finish out the regular season. Eric Lopez, Brian Murphy, will you guys come out and see volleyball this weekend? Because I will be there doing PA for these matches. I might be there Friday. I will not be there send, uh, Sunday. Because uh, there's a UCF men's basketball game right down the hall. Uh, well, you'll kind Friday, of. I, yeah, I, I mean, I'll be there. I'll be in the building. I just won't be in that building. Yeah. I'll be. I'll be in another part of the same building. By the way, lots of alumni coming out since this is homecoming weekend. Um, they are turning out. Uh, the, uh, Todd Dagenet and Jenny Mauer and and all the folks with UCF volleyball. They are uh, and and Brian Doyle and everybody. They've been. Um, working the phones nonstop to get some alumni down for this weekend. Um, they're going to be uh, unveiling a new, uh, retiring a new number. Tyra Harper is getting her number retired. Um, and we're also going to have a little celebration of the 40th anniversary of the 1978 uh, Na- AIAW National Championship team that went 55 and oh, uh, 40 years since that national title. Um, and then, of course, there's this huge match with Cincinnati. Um, uh, just to look at where they are in the RPI, UCF right now is 11th in the RPI. 11th in the RPI. Um, Cincinnati, no slouch, 23rd. Um, having a very good season of their own with Jordan Thompson, and yet here they are trying desperately to hang on to any shred of, uh, of a chance of a conference title. Uh, they have. Remember, there's no tournament in the American. The regular season champion um, gets the auto bid to the NCAA. In the AVCA coaches poll, UCF moved up again to 22. They moved up one spot. They're just behind UCLA, just ahead of Tennessee, Mizzou, and Washington. Actually, they're just behind three Pac-12 teams, UCLA, Arizona, and Washington State. Florida, by the way, incidentally ranked 14th. USC, who UCF beat earlier this year, is 13th. So, number one, by the way, BYU. And this is why another reason why this Cincinnati match is big from a conference standpoint, but from a resume standpoint. Now, UCF is ahead of Florida in the RPI. Yeah. I believe you could double check. 
I believe UCF is ranked. Uh, you said what, 11 in the RPI? Uh, hang on, I'm pulling it up right now. UCF is That's 11th Florida. in the RPI. Florida is 21st. So they're ahead in the RPI, but Florida is ahead in the polls. Now the committee for volleyball came out with their first top 10 on Halloween. And that was discouraging to see because, for example, and you keep that RPI in front of you there, Jeff, because you're going you're gonna to see what I'm going with this. All right. This. Among the teams in the top 10 in the RPI. I'll read, the, uh, I'll read off the uh, – you tell me the teams. I'll read off their RPI rank. Right. Well, this is the committee's top 10. This was as of Halloween. This is like their BYU. version of the CFP, right? <laughs> yes. BYU is number one. RPI of number three. Stanford is number two. RPI number one. Minnesota is number three. RPI four. Illinois is number four. RPI number two. Wisconsin, five. RPI number seven. Number six is Texas. RPI is number five. Number seven, USC. RPI number six. USC's RPI is not that bad. Number eight, here we go. You all have this one. Okay. Penn State. Penn State, whoa, RPI number uh-huh. 17. Mm-hmm. Nine spots. Man. Yep. Number nine, Nebraska. Nebraska's RPI is 14th. And then Creighton rounds out the top 10. RPI number 16. Wow, so no Kentucky, no Pittsburgh, no Washington State. Those are the three teams ahead of UCF in the RPI that you didn't mention. Purdue, Michigan, Nebraska. Well, Nebraska's 14th, you mentioned them. But Purdue and Michigan, 12 and 13, just behind UCF. Uh, Northern Iowa is 15th out of the Missouri Valley. No mention of them. Creighton in the Big East at number 16. Hmm. The thing that worries me, the reason I bring that up, especially on the back end, like Penn State gets the benefit of the doubt because they're Penn State. Uh, so they get the top ten RP, uh, top ten spot by the committee, even though they're what seventeen in the RPI as you reference. Yeah. My concern, Jeff, is if there's not enough room for UCF and Florida to host. I mean, technically, you would. You know, and this is the this is what frustrates me about these things is they, they they'll say they'll go by the RPI except when they don't want to go with the RPI. You know, I'm <laughs> worried that they're going to go with Florida, and UCF's going to have to go to Florida, even though UCF may end up with a higher RPI. Man, um, I'll tell you. And I think that 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 and and you saw that with Penn State and Florida's coming off a year where they played for the national title. If Florida wouldn't win the SEC, they may get the benefit of the doubt. You know, so we'll see now. But again, UCF has to make this an argument, and by doing it, if they can beat Cincinnati, Jeff, and win out, uh, they would make a strong case uh, to maybe at least host, maybe not be a top ten, but host over Florida and force Florida to come here to the venue. Wouldn't that be something? That's what I. I, you know, I think that's the question here: is can will the committee reward UCF if they win out and have Florida and Florida State more than likely come to Orlando, or will they actually have, uh, or they're going to make UCF go out to Florida? Yeah, you know, that's you know. man. All right. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Well, beating Cincinnati uh, this week. This is the biggest volleyball week, and as as I can remember in a long time, um, beat got to beat Cincinnati first. Um, then you got ECU. SMU Houston in the where's the standings? SMU is at six and seven. Houston is at the bottom of the league at two and eleven. Um, and then you finish out with USF and South Florida is seven and six. So, you know, obviously these last five very winnable. If UCF wins this, uh, it gets to let's see. We said that they have won. Night was it nineteen in a row? If they get to twenty-two, if I'm not mistaken, Ian McDougal's going to correct me on this. Uh, if they get to twenty-two, that ties um, a re- a record for the longest win streak I think in twenty-one years. I think nineteen ninety-seven under Laura Smith. That team won twenty-two in a row at one point. But now, obviously, it's not the longest win streak in program history. For that, you have to go back. To that seventy-eight team, which went fifty-five and zero. I mean, that's which is beyond nuts. But um, but that was in a different era. I think in the modern era, I think it's twenty-two wins in a row. So Friday night at seven, 
Uh, UCF against Cincinnati. Come check out the Knights, uh, who've won 19 in a row. And uh, U.S. Olympic team hopeful Jordan Thompson playing for Cincinnati. So um, Knights took care of business up in Cincy by uh, really um, bottling up Jordan in that match, even though she, 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 well, she was Jordan Thompson. She had almost 30 kills in the match anyway, but she was the only thing going for Cincinnati. So it's going to be an interesting chess match for um, UCF and the Bearcats on Friday and then East Carolina on Sunday. Alumni weekend at UCF Volleyball. Come check it out. All right. Hoops. Murph. Yes. You were <laughs> you were at uh, the opener for UCF men's basketball uh, at home uh, against Ryder. A phenomenal, phenomenal black hat. The man and in the black hat. It was I, phenomenal. It was, God. You, you almost got killed by a block shot by Chad Brown. <laughs> I almost got straight up murdered yeah. at the first game of the year. Right there. I mean, it would have been it would have been bad. Um, but uh, UCF looked a little. It almost looked like one of the football games. Looked a little skittish in the first half. Got their feet underneath them. Um, and then turned it on in the second half. And Ryder made it a little close at one point, but it really wasn't that um wasn't that much of a of a thing to worry about. You know, final score eighty four seventy um over the Bronx, not the Broncos. The Bronx. Yeah. Yeah. B R O N C S, not B R O N X, which is not all that far from Ryder's campus, but anyway. Um, uh, impressions from the game, though, Murph. It was, uh, you know, it was kind. Of, this is, by the way, Ryder's a good team. They're the unanimous pick to win the MWAC. Who MAAC. told you this? Who told you this, Jeff? I know, I know. It's a, it, unanimous selection. Uh, so they're they're a good basketball team, but UCF was better than them in this game. So, um, your initial thoughts on this first time out? I thought uh, the first half, they looked like a team who hadn't played in eight months. Uh, UCF, that is, because, you know, they hadn't. Uh, And so they were cold (laughs) shooting. Yeah, how about that? Uh, They were cold shooting the ball basically anywhere on the floor. Um, Afterwards, you know, Coach Dawkins and B.J. Taylor both chalked it up to jitters, uh, which I kind of believe because we heard from players who – who expected to feel kind of nervous heading into this game. Well, that intro um, before the game didn't exactly help matters when they had that stage up there for homecoming and like they used that to intro the players for the, for the game. I mean, that was like, that was man. That since, was nuts. Since, since you brought that up, let me, let me bring out the world's tiniest violin for one second here. <laughs> uh, do you know that media row for right basketball was stationed right there, right in front of that staging area. Mm -hmm. And for about two and a half hours, I got to feel the sensation of my brain literally shaking inside of my skull. (laughs) And uh, so while it was fun to see all the smoke going off and whatever, I want to make a plea here, never do that again. (laughs) I meant to that, bro. Never. Yeah. Ever do yeah. that again? You are you are the no fun league man. You're. Uh, I tell you what. I'm with Murph. No, I'm with Murph. Like, <laughs> I, I tell you what. It, well, I listen, might ha- I'll give I I'll give Jimmy have... Skiles and the guys a little bit of credit. They made the best of a difficult logistical situation in the arena. They did. They did. I I'm just question, saying. A serious question though, Murph. Was anybody did anybody comment there about as far as a backdrop affecting the shooting? Because it seemed uh, to you... me. That both teams struggled early on when they're on that side of the court. So I mean, it, you know, you could say it was even out. But I thought, you know, did that do you think that contributed to UCF slow start? But you know, with a new backdrop, you're not used to that. And then Ryder uh, struggled with that at the beginning of the second half. Right. I, that, I remember that the I remember that was asked uh, at the post game press conference. You forgive me if I forgot the exact answer, but I do, I do believe that both players and coaches kind of kind of shooed that away much. They didn't give it a whole lot of credence. I always uh, thought that that was always over it. They always talk about that at the Final Four, right? Right. Well, well, in the Final Four, I mean, when they're in a dome, those, you know, when they're when they're in Houston, the, when the Houston like in the Indianapolis stagings are really stupid. It, it, it is kind of weird <laughs> there, but um, for 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 this sort of thing, I don't think they they put too much stock into it. Um, but anyway, as as the game as the game was, not what's really important, not you know my physical well being. Uh, Is that going to be gone actual... by the FAU game, though? I mean, yeah, it'll be, be gone. It'll be it'll be gone after this week once all the homecoming concerts are done. Right. Please, I I <laughs> pray to the sun god Ra. Let that be move. a Murphy's law. Right hey, 
Um, so anyway, back to sports, guys. Hashtag content. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so, you know, they were they were shaky early, down by five, about three and a half to go. B.J. Taylor had scored, I think, two points in the entire half to that point, and then he sort of gets going late in that first half, and it starts to snowball from there for UCF on both ends of the floor. They force some turnovers. They get easy baskets on the other end. There were jumpers hit by Aubrey Dawkins and Terrell Allen, and all of a sudden a five-point deficit turns into a nine-point lead going into the half like that. And really, this was this game was not within double digits for basically the entire second half. Um, UCF controlled it throughout. Uh, they they stretched the lead up to 24. Uh, I was obviously impressed by Aubrey Dawkins getting out there for the first time in two and a half years. Uh, put up 16 points, 10 rebounds. I thought Colin Smith was fantastic. I mean, yeah. I, look, consider, consider this. Colin Smith is basically taking the roster spot of a, a suspended Rokas Alvitas. Uh It is amazing the, the difference in just – talent and ability and versatility that Colin Smith gives you and putting him on the court with taco fall, which is they're able to do because, because, Ch- because, excuse me, because, uh, Colin doesn't need to be in the paint at all times. He can kind of come out to the perimeter a little bit and guard. He can go inside if he wants to. He was really effective on both ends. I thought, uh, he got, he got a double double as well. BJ Taylor again, had basically nothing in the first half, still ended up with 22 points. For a first game of the year against a team, as you said, Jeffrey, that is predicted to win its conference in Ryder, uh, won the conference last year, was a top 60 team ranked by the Athletic uh, in the top 60 in the nation. Um, this was a pretty solid win after those kind of opening jitters. It's kind of impressive. Yeah. So now they play FAU <clears throat> Excuse me, on Sunday uh, at 3, um, and that, that game is going to be televised on ESPN 3 as well. Little A Sun throwback action, UCF against FAU before they go to the uh, Myrtle Beach Invitational, where they open up against uh, Cal State Fullerton up in Conway, South another Carolina. So another tournament team from last year. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, you haven't obviously you haven't talked to the team since um, since that game, aside from the post game. But uh, word on FAU, at least as of right now, everybody seems to be you know healthy to this point, right? Yeah, how about that? We're one game into a season, and this team is in rack with injuries. <laughs> I'll take it, man. Well, I mean, how many Change minutes did to, did Taco Fall and BJ Taylor play together last last year? I think well, it was like maybe one oh, half. Right, they played. I think they played in one full game together. I think yeah. that's what it was before, and then, they, before they were out. And Aubrey was out the entire time, and he and he looks mm-hmm. like he's actually just finding his stride. Yeah, he was. It, it, he had a hard time shooting the ball. Um, he finished what, they one all of eight. Did. Yeah, he was one of eight from three point range. Um, but you know, like you said, he he hit the boards. Um, Taco didn't have the most impressive game in the world. Uh, got into a little no, bit of foul trouble was, late, but he no, did have the five what, blocks. Right. Yeah, but Murph. I think Murph said it though. Colin Smith is a big difference yeah. maker because a I huge actually like. Yeah, I liked them when he was on the court playing center when Taco was out with the uh, foul issues or whatever. I thought they looked good because he's got a nice low post game. Mm-hmm. He's big. He can, he, she can shoot. He can move. Yeah. They can bring Chad. They can bring Chad Brown in and move Chad Brown to the four. Yes. I mean, yes. they can move. Aubrey can go anywhere from basically one through three. Um, it, it's a versatile deep team. I mean, we haven't you know we don't talk about Chance McSpadden or De, or Caesar DeJesus or Deion Griffin. All these guys are gonna get minutes. Uh, this team's going to shoot the ball well because they're going to rely on a lot of threes. They will live and die by the three in a lot of games. And I thought for a game in which they shot five of 22 from deep to still win by 14 over yeah. a pretty good team, I thought that, that, that's impressive. Well, yeah, a team that okay, also shot 41% too. I mean, Ryder was, hit, Ryder was hitting from outside. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think they're going to defend, and I think with the size they have and the depth they have inside, they shoot, they're going to be a good rebounding team. I liked a lot what I saw. I mean, you mentioned it, Murph. Uh, I think, too, what helps is guys like DeJesus and Griffin are going to be in the appropriate roles. Because of the right. injuries, they were probably asked to do more than they can really do. If this team stays healthy, I think this team is clearly the best team in the American. I've seen Cincinnati already. They lost to uh, Ohio State, and I saw Wichita State lose to Louisiana Tech. They're obviously in a bit of a rebuild over there at Wichita. I think they're the top team here, and if they can stay healthy, uh, this could be a year of uh, one shiny moment, my friend. 
That's what oh, this uh, could be about. Andy oh, Katz. Andy, Andy Katz. Katz making an appearance okay, here. Andy Katz. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he said, by the way, this year UCF could be uh, this year's uh, Chicago. Uh, Loyola. Uh, Loyola. Yeah, I don't know Chicago, about that. I, so. I, 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 I didn't. I'll be honest. I didn't feel comfortable let's, about all that. Let's praise. get past FAU first, shall we? To quote Josh. I mean, to quote Josh Heupel. Let's go one and zero. I mean, who's gonna be who's gonna be the sister Jean? I know somebody in a wheelchair, so we got that part. <laughs> down. We got that part. Oh, that. Nice I went there. Oh my god! Right? The hat. Showcase so, the hat. Right. Uh, give me some give me some rosaries, you know, and see what happens. I just joined a clergy between now and then. Um, you just want to be interviewed by. The, you just uh, who was it that kept interviewing her back in that tournament run? It was uh, Jamie. Was it Jamie Maggio? Who was it that was kept? I something like that. that. Yeah, I yeah. don't know, I, guys. I just know I'm going to hell. I just want to <laughs> say that at the end of the show. You're, I'm definitely going to don't, hell. Don't don't make me don't make me have to hit the little E button for explicit. Um, when I upload this, <laughs> um, it's a play. You know, you, you, by the way, interviewed her at the Elite Eight. There you uh, go. So you know. And then right. you had the uh, so yeah you had a different uh, female, but we, we get where you're going with there, Murph. We get where you're going with that. Big Thanks. news earlier today, also from basketball. Speaking of teams that could surprise somebody, well, <laughs> they've already surprised somebody. UCF women's basketball in their opener up at Pitt, um, down eleven at one point in the game to an ACC opponent on their floor. On uh, by by the way, it was school day at Pitt, so they had a bunch of school kids, local school kids. Fill in the arena. Why? Is that why it was an 11 a.m. tip? Yes, that's why. So, uh, mm. and a bunch wow. of school kids there. So pretty cool little atmosphere. Kids were going nuts. They were following along with it. You know, pretty neat. So, in comes UCF, and they spoil school day for Pitt um, <laughs> by beating them 61 <laughs> 58. Um, UCF, this is amazing. The Knights were 1 for 12 from the field in the first quarter and still won the game. Um, mm. For the game they shot in the fourth quarter, they were 6 of 11. Uh, leading scorers for the Knights, K.K. Wright, boy, has she, just, has she gotten good or what? 19 points on 8 of 17 from the field. Um, 4 points, 10 rebounds for Nyla Schuler. Um, newcomer Brittany Smith, a freshman, contributed 4 points and 4 rebounds. New, another newcomer, Sydney McDonald, um, sort of playing that that. Uh, that off guard position, five of twelve from the field. She hit three threes, fourteen points for the Knights, um, and uh, also seven off the bench for Jamisha Paul, and uh, five off the bench for Masani Kaba, and uh, and boom, UCF gets the victory over Pitt. Um, man, this this that was. Now I know Pitt's not quite the Pitt of old, right? Ten and twenty um, last year. By the way, interestingly, both new head Pitt men and women hoops. Yeah. New head coaches. Yeah, we new... just own Pitt in every sport. By the way, I know way. we're just we're just killing Pitt and everything. Like like Pitt, like, mm-hmm. d- 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 don't come at us. Don't come at us, Pitt. That's enough. Um, Jesus. But UCF is one and zero victory over an ACC opponent. What does that say about uh, Coach Abe's team here? Because uh, you know, we, um, I I wrote up our preview um, this morning before the game. Uh, and finished that off and got that and watched the game. And lo and behold, man, they, uh, yeah, they went down, but 11 nights saw action. This is a deep, deep team, Eric. Well, they had a lot of injuries last year. So I mean, <laughs> they get some bodies back and some new faces. I mean, how about Sidney McDonald, 14 points starting in that guard spot? Remember, you lost a tremendous guard last year that was your best player, so you wonder who would pick up the scoring last yeah. from that loss. Zakia Saunders uh, uh, last yeah, with year. Yeah, with, with Z, you know, gradually moving on. So maybe it's Sidney McDonald at 14 points, 5 of 12 from the field, was second in shooting. How about K.K. Wright, 8 of 17 from the floor, much aggressive uh, there. And then, you know, what was fascinating to me is that Kaba Masney was coming off the bench and was limited to 15 minutes. Uh, you got this young lady, Brittany uh, Smith, that started. He's got some new faces. Of course, Tolu is back, played mm-hmm. 10 minutes. Um, so they've got some size all of a sudden inside. And um, they, like you said, they didn't, you know, they came back from 11 down. Um, really, really good, a nice job there. And they forced 20 turnovers from Pitt. And they only had uh, seven turnovers. You yeah. see, they've only turned it over seven times. That's pretty, whereas Pitt turned it over 20 times in the game. That's a big difference in the ball game. And they were able to pull it out. A nice win on the road. Yeah, so their uh, schedule now uh, looks like this 
coming up. Uh, they, uh, by the way, this team doesn't play a home game until Thanksgiving. Actually, after Thanksgiving, which is pretty remarkable. Um, they're on the road at Stetson on Wednesday, the 14th. So actually one week from when we're recording this, 7 p.m. So uh, game up in DeLand. Uh, then they go to Mercer in another old A-Sun foe, Sunday, November 18th. They're at Central Michigan Wednesday, November 21st, and then finally come home for a Thanksgiving tournament on uh, Saturday and Sunday of Thanksgiving against Richmond on Saturday and Villanova on that uh, Sunday. Uh, so quite a while before we get to see this team at home, but they're 1-0, beat an ACC opponent. Not a bad way uh, to start the year. All right, guys, let's finish this thing up as we uh, as we wrap up here, get ready for this uh, insanely busy weekend of uh, of UCF sports. We're, we're smack dab in the middle of the sports equinox now, man. Let me tell you. Um, uh, Murph, what do you have uh, coming up this year? I know earlier you mentioned it, but I want, but it bears mentioning again. You were on the AAC Daily Podcast with C. Austin Cox earlier today. Yeah, you know, we're just shooting the breeze for about 10 minutes or so. Talking about, about the meaning of life and all that. Right, you know, and and I talked about again my my, my afterlife fate, but we talked about UCF basketball and football, the CFP polls, which is totally my favorite topic to talk about. I mean, absolutely. Um, it was a good conversation. I think it'll be up on the site. If if you don't see it there, it's on my Twitter account at yeah. underscore Murphy. I'll be I'll, I'll be there. putting it up on uh, on our site, but in the next twenty four hours, you'll see it up there. So That's fine, but enjoy. other than that, there's a there's a there's a football game on 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 Saturday at noon, and then there's a basketball game on Sunday. So it'll be <laughs> fun weekend. I mean, there's sports, Jeffrey. By the way, I just want to throw this out here with the the women's basketball getting the P six win hashtag P six, uh-huh. and men's basketball's expectations for what they could do this season. Thank you, Andy Katz, and <laughs> women women's volleyball on a historic run. Men's soccer top ten in the nation. We know what's going on with with football. What can I do to become Danny White for maybe an hour, like just an hour? That's all. I, I'm giving I wanna... you credit. I'm giving you credit, Murph, because ever since you returned to Orlando, I don't think you, <laughs> football has not lost since you started covering this team again last year. No, I've got a, I got a better one for you. I got a better one for you. <laughs> Jesus. So, um, my daughter uh, Eliza, who uh, just turned one a few weeks back. Eliza has not experienced a UCF football loss going back to when she was in the womb. <laughs> so I just wanted to get that out there for everybody. In, in her entire life, Jeff's daughter only knows winning. Only knows she only knows how to, all she only she knows knows how to go 1-0 every yeah. week. <laughs> so, like, what's going to happen? You know, I mean, what, what's going to happen if we lose? I mean, you know. I mean, she was devastated to see Scott Frost go to go to Nebraska, and she she I know she hates Bill Moose with a passion, but <laughs> but <laughs> wow, yeah, I, I beat that. <laughs> Good stuff. So, uh, Eric, what do you got coming up? Got a lot going on. If you go to blackandgoldbanneret dot com, uh, you'll see uh, I wrote. A uh, recap of my interview with Heather Tarr on, a, on the In the Circle podcast where she talked about Cindy Ball and this new UCF softball staff. I'm also bringing back the seven points. That'll be with Aaron Campbell, former night great volleyball player, broadcaster. So we'll catch up with her. Uh, and Digital realize, marketer. Yeah. Top six, by the way, in a lot of major categories in UCF volleyball history. I don't I don't know if people appreciate how good she was because you know this, Jeff. She came there right as UCF just started playing in Conference USA. So they had the transition from A-Sun to Conference USA. Mm-hmm. And then she was kind of her career. She had the, you know, had the transition from Meg Collado to Todd Dagenet. She was played there when Todd arrived. So, um, you know, but uh, she's obviously excited about where the program is at today. So it was fun to catch up with her. And uh, you can check that out on blackandgobanneret.com. I will be on the Mark Moses Show Thursday. That's in uh, the Vieira Melbourne market. I will be tweeting that out on Eric Lopez Elo. I was on an ESPN 1050 in Sebring, Florida with my friend Chris Pinson. That was on Tuesday. That's on my Twitter account as well as Eric Lopez Elo. So, uh, you know, you got a lot of that going on. Cool, cool. And uh, what do you call it? We've also got our basketball previews up. Luke Saris covered the men's team. 
I've got the uh, women's team. We'll go a little bit more in depth as we uh, as we hit the winter break once football uh, kind of takes kind of moves off of center stage a little bit and uh, have a little bit more basketball for you as well. But we'll be covering uh, UCF football and basketball as we head down the stretch here in the final few games of uh, football season as we roll on toward through the month of um, November. So this should be a lot of fun. Make sure you join our um, live uh, game thread on Saturday. Noon kickoff for UCF against Navy. We'll start that thing up a little bit earlier than that, about an hour before kickoff. So make sure you follow that. Just keep it locked for your second screen the, that entire time where we've got all the latest news for you on that. So uh, that will do it for us for this week's Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Eric Lopez and Brian... Excuse me, Brian Murphy. Thanks, guys. Uh, appreciate it. I'll see you down. I'll see you down. Hopefully, at volleyball on Friday, huh? Yeah, uh-huh. it's the end of the show. Jeff's all choked up. I know. Very emotional. I know. It's mm. I'm still fighting off this cold, and it's unbelievable. I'm going to go to bed after this. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, I'm going to get out of here so I don't get any of that. Ah. See you, boys. Yeah, like you would pick it up over the over the internet. Um, it's not a computer virus, Eric. For crying out loud. Oh goodness! Um, so let's for the show, yeah, the let's show get out of here. Ended six Black seconds and, ago. I know. Black and gold banneret dot com. UCF underscore banneret on Twitter. Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric Lopez. Elo spokes underscore Murphy on Twitter. Facebook dot com slash black and gold banneret. Thanks again to Mitch Northam of Against All Enemies. Primetime Mitch on Twitter. A A A A E underscore S B N for Against All Enemies to follow all the uh, service academies. A A E underscore S B N. So for all of us here at Black and Gold Banneret, thank you so much for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Uh, don't forget, we'll catch you on Saturday and probably Friday too for all the sports happening this week at UCF. For Brian and Eric, I'm Jeff. We'll see you this weekend. Today's episode is brought to you by cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical.